just want you I just want you I just want you We just want you We just want you We just want you We just want you
I love this quote from Booker T. Washington. If you want to lift yourself up, lift up someone else. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharika Guyton, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you to Envision Christian Fellowship. We are so honored that you have chosen to worship with us here on this platform on the last Sunday in February. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 states, For where there are two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The Lord's presence is definitely here today. Now, Dr. Michael A. Chambers will deliver the message. Thank you for tuning in on today. Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us with an opportunity to come together and to worship him in spirit and truth. We're grateful that you connected and find yourself in a place of worship, teaching and preaching. We're grateful for your presence and your participation. Let us go to the Lord in prayer together. God, our Father, we're so thankful for this day, Master, most of all. Thankful for your darling son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to come before you with thanksgiving and celebration in our heart. God, we ask that you bless those who are viewing online or listening by some other form of technology. And we're thankful, God, that we have this moment, this opportunity to engage, uh, to celebrate, and to magnify your holy name. God, we're praying right now that you will give us conciseness of the text, clarity, but most of all, give us what is needed to navigate through the principles of your word. It's in your darling son, Jesus Christ, then we do pray. Amen. Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us with an opportunity to come together and to celebrate his name and to do what God would have us to do as it relates to the word of the living God. So I want to invite your attention to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 30, 1 Samuel chapter number 30. And I want to begin, uh, if we can, in verse number 2, 1 Samuel chapter 30. I want to begin in verse number 2. It says, and had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Verse number three. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Verse number five, and David's two wives, Ananon and Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Verse number six, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened or encouraged himself in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tag this text during the Samaritan spotlight with this thought, and that is this, uh, bouncing back after overwhelming difficulties. Bouncing back after overwhelming difficulties. As we think about it and consider bouncing back after overwhelming difficulties, a reminder of the story of a golfer, uh, William Hogan, whose car was hit by a bus, because of, an, because of an accident that left him lying by the roadside, wounded, a great career was ended. Uh, we thought it was doubtful if he would ever walk again, let alone play golf. However, as soon as possible, he got braces and began to swing the golf clubs. It was a painful process. However, he kept on swinging. He bounced back and later came back to win both the United States Open and the British Open Championships. For some, this kind of wound is just a scratch. It stings, but it does not sideline you. For some, it's a scar. It reminds you of a long past battle that you've gone through. Maybe internally resolved, maybe not. 
your wound could be a scab. It covers a fresh injury that is in the process of healing. No problem as long as no one bumps or picks at it. For others, it may be a sore. It is a tender and raw but sharp shooting pain that constantly reminds you of its presence, regardless of the category. For the wound, we must be determined to stop the nursing the pain and refuse to continue rehearsing the pain and start reversing the pain and moving forward in our lives. Because life has a tendency to offer us challenges, difficulties, overwhelming situations that may be beyond our control and our capacity to deal with it at that moment in time. But I want to suggest, brothers and sisters, as we get to the text on the day, that you and I can bounce back after overwhelming difficulties. As we look at this text on the day, I'm reminded, brothers and sisters, that many of us find ourselves in that place now, possibly dealing with a loss, dealing with the complexities of loss, or perhaps in the loss of a job or a lost opportunity, uh, perhaps in a relationship that has gone completely opposite of what you had expected or anticipated. Or maybe uh, you find yourself in the, uh, the, the, the latter stages of your life and what you thought should have happened and occurred, you find yourself in a very precarious place. But I want to suggest that you can still bounce back after overwhelming difficulties because I believe David, who's a man after God's own heart, can teach us a lesson, can share with us a principle, can show us and present to us a pathway forward, a moment in time where you can navigate through the most tumultuous time in your life and still be in a better place, in a, be in, in a, in a good place, uh, a place of resilience, a place of restoration, a place of renewal, but also a place of re-engagement in life. So I want to suggest on the day you can bounce back after overwhelming difficulties. As we listen to David, as he goes through this experience on today, I want to encourage you to look at uh, chapter 30. We will notice that David is in conflict with the Amalekites, uh, this raiding band of individuals who uh, were notorious, uh, were uh, always gnawing at the heels of the children uh, of Israel. But as we find ourselves, in this place, verse number one says that it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Malachites had invaded the south and the Ziglags had attacked Ziglag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women of those who were there with him from small to great. And here we are, brothers and sisters, they were notorious for nagging at the heels of the children of God. They were notorious for trying to raid their camp uh, it was nothing unusual to find them constantly and consistently trying to disrupt, devour, and destroy the people of God. But you got to understand it is David who has just come back uh, from a battle, from a scene in which he was instrumental. Uh, he and his men who had rose early uh, to depart from the land of Phil Philistine, the Philistines went up to Jezreel. And here we are, we have David at this place and point in his life, when he's gone through and experienced moments of victory, he's experienced those moments of achieving a win, if you will. He has also overcome a, a battle prior to chapter 30, but now he finds himself in a very risky place in life. He finds himself in a place where uh, the moment that he did not expect to occur happened. The thing that he thought that would never show up has now reared his head, and here is David. He's paused, positioned in part, trying to unravel and uncover the situation that has happened to him at this moment. As we look at it very closely, the text says in verse number four, notice what it says here, if you will. David says in verse number three, it says, so David and his men came up to the, the city, and there it was, it burned with, with fire, and their wives, their sons, their daughters, had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep or to cry or to allow tears to fall 
from their eyes. Have you been in that place? Have you been in that moment where tears are endless? Uh, tears have gotten to the point now you have a stained face and you're no longer able to uh, uh, afford yourself the, the privilege and opportunity to allow the tears to flow from your eyes. But I want to suggest to you that if you're going to bounce back after uh, overwhelming difficulties, one is you got to walk through uh, your weariness with worthwhile weeping. Notice here it is. They are weeping uh, because of the fact they were broken over the burned city. They were broken over the brutalized captives. But here it is. Notice uh, the contrast between the two. Because as we continue to, to navigate through this text, we will notice that the tears uh, in this moment in times takes us in two different directions. David is trying to move forward as a result of his tear uh, to deal with the issues, to deal with the trauma, to deal with the challenges, to deal with the moments. But now on the opposite side, the people that he was with, the people that he engaged with, he went in the foxhole with, that he worked with, that he went to war with, that he went to battle with. Now they began to do something different. They began to blame and prepare to stone David to death. So I want to tell you that tears can take you in one or two routes. It can take you toward the route of blame or it can take you toward the right route of transformation. And as a result of that, I want to suggest to you that if you're going to bounce back after lasting or overwhelming difficulties, it has to be moments of worthwhile weeping because we understand that tears are the language to the soul and it will determine who you will be in that moment, who you will emerge as a person of God, what will be your uh, persona, what will be your demeanor, what will be your personality, how will you react, how will you respond, will it be a moment of blame or will it be a moment of transformation, and I want to suggest to you worthwhile weeping is necessary because the text says that they wept until they could not weep anymore. It was David and the men, but they both went in two different directions. David went toward transformation and the people that were with him went toward blame. But here it is, brothers and sisters. Uh, this is why I know that uh, weeping, the worthwhile weeping is necessary because it was the writer Vance Habner who said, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give us strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives birth a uh, fourth uh, a perfume. It is Peter weeping bitterly after his failure of denying Jesus who returns to greater power than ever before. So I'm going to suggest to you that the tears that the crying, uh, uh, that the water that comes from your eyes has two routes that it can take. It can either take the route of blame or it can take the route of transformation. And, but I want to suggest to you that here we are dealing with two schools of thought in the text. But David emerges with worthwhile weeping and he's crying and he's tearful uh, because of the broken, uh, broken uh, city, uh, the broken uh, the broken, broken over the burned city, and he's broken over the brutalized captives. Brothers and sisters, can't you hear David and his men as they come back toward the camp and they see the smoke and the fire, and then suddenly they, they look and see throughout the length and breadth of that particular community in that area, everything that they had worked for, everything that they had went to battle for, everything that was in their mind when they went to battle with the hopes of returning to a warm place, to a warm spot, to, to relationships, to people, to folks in the community. But yet they find themselves in a very precarious place. And they began to gauge in crying tearfulness and weeping from the eyes. But one set of tears takes the route of blame, but the other set of tears takes the route of transformation. And it's David who is engaged in worthwhile weeping. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, here it is. Uh, not only that, must one walk through the weariness with worthwhile weeping, but secondly, one must emerge from your extremities with the Effective encouragement. Look what the text says. Look at verse number six, if you will. The text says it's here very clearly. Let me back it up here. And you will notice what happens. It says, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved 
every man for his sons and his daughters. But notice what it says. The divine conjunction drops down in the text. It says, but David strengthened himself. David encouraged himself in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, hear this. David could have been overwhelmed by the moment. David could have been or outdone by the, the time that he was experienced, but David did not turn turn inwardly, but he turned upwardly. He did not allow his tears to go toward blame, but he allows his tears to go toward transformation. So that's what I'm going to stop by today to tell you that here he is, he's engaged in effective encouragement. Because the text from the King James says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. Another translation said that he strengthened himself in the Lord. He began to speak over it because he understood that, uh, that, that the, uh, uh, there is power in the tongue. It will determine whether or not it will be life or death. But David spoke positively. David spoke with spiritually. David spoke practically. David spoke intentionally. And he begins to encourage himself in the Lord. So now, brothers and sisters, what you got to see, what you got to underscore, the crowd that was with David, the pack that was around David, the men that surrounded him were no longer. And here is David. He finds himself on the outside looking in and he cannot get the encouragement from the people that he went to battle with. He cannot get the encouragement from the people that he was in the foxhole with. He cannot get the encouragement from the individuals that walked and marched back and forth between the Philistine region back to the place of his homeland. But he begins to encourage himself in the Lord. Sometimes it's just you and the Lord in the battles and in the burdens and the challenges of life, David says, he says, I've got to engage in worthwhile weeping, but I got to have my effective encouragement. Why? David embarked barks upon this effective encouragement. Number one, he recognized the human limitation. There were some places that those folks that were possibly his friends that was in the same uniform with him in the same unit, a part of the same crew that with the battle, but they were, they were, the limitation was there. They could not get to the place where David was in his walk with God. They were not at the same position. They were not at the same station. And so there was some human limitation, but David also recognized the divine obligation because the Bible says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. Notice here, his God. The Lord, his God, not, not his friend's God, not his family's God, but his God, the one he had developed a relationship with. The same David that talked about that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Means that, that he's, the, he's the shepherd of his life. Before, presently, and in the future, David says the Lord, his God. So David recognized the human limitation, but also David recognized his divine obligation was to, re, uh, to engage in encouraging himself. It was one writer that talked about a well-known sports analyst who grew up uh, uh, desiring and loving the sport of boxing. But he was fascinated by the sport, even though he was never good at it. He said in boxing, you're on your own. You're in that square circle by yourself. You're in that ring by yourself as the blood and the, and the sweat is hitting uh, uh, the canvas. You're in that ring by yourself. He says, there's no place to hide. He says, at the end of the, the match, only one boxer has his hand raised up. That's it. He has, to, he has no one to credit, no one to blame except himself. But this writer says, he says, who boxed in high school? He says his coach's greatest goal was to teach his boxers that they absolutely positively, without question, had to have a get up inside themselves. He said, if you're going to be in the ring uh, uh, just once in your life, completely and on your own, you got to be, if you get knocked down, you got to be willing to get back up again. But also remember that you have a, a have a trainer, you have a coach 
in the corner. You have that person in your corner uh, bellowing out uh, instruction, giving out guidance, giving out source of strength, giving out maneuvers and strategies as you fight through the phases and the challenges of that match. Likewise, it is God that is in your corner. It is God that's on the on the outside of the ring. He's not necessarily outside of the ring, but he's inside of the ring helping you and assisting you. So therefore, that's why David says, I shall encourage myself in the Lord. David knew that he was not alone. David knew that he was not by himself. David knew that he had a divine escort through the most grueling and the most traumatic time in his life. So much so that he encouraged himself in the Lord. Brothers and sisters, here it is. The text says, as we look at it very closely, look at verse number eight. The text says, it clearly says, then David said to Abaddon, the priest, am I like, son, uh, please bring the ephod here to me. Notice he says, bring it here to me. And he brought the ephod to David. So David uh, inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this truth? Shall I overtake them? Notice, if you will, even though he's exhausted, even though he's traumatized, even though he's overwhelmed, David has engaged in the moments of effective encouragement. Now David pushes through the pain with powerful prayer. He begins to make an inquiry. He begins to make uh, to gain insight. He wants the uh, he wants the intel as to what he needs to do at this moment in time in his life. He does not go back to the men. He does not go back to the crowd, but it is David trying to make an inquiry into God as to what his will was, as to what his purpose, what was his direction, what was his guidance. So if you're going to back up, bounce back after overwhelming difficulties, you got to find yourself pushing through the pain with powerful praying. I know it's not, I know it's not in vogue. I know it's not uh, in tune with the rest of the world. But I want to suggest to you, that, brothers and sisters, that the prayer will change the circumstances or change your mind toward the circumstances that surround you. Here's David. The first thing we underscore is that it reveals David's dependence on the Lord. He depends on the Lord to get him through, to get him over, to help him to win, to help him to triumph to help him to push through that moment that seems humanly impossible. Why do you think the proverb writer said the best? He said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding, but in all thy ways, acknowledge him. Here it is. He shall direct your path. So now David understands. It reveals David's dependence on the Lord, but it also reveals David's direction from the Lord. He wants direction from God because God is Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. God is that place, that space, who can see the things around you, see the things before you. So David says, I need to pray to God because of my dependence upon him, and because I need to seek direction from him. Because understand this, this prayer, this talking, this communication, this engagement, this moment of inquiring of God suggests to us that prayer is not man prescribing to God, but man subscribing from God. Prayer is man having a little talk with Jesus, knowing he'll make everything all come out all right. Prayer is a telephone in your bosom which has a direct line to God's heart. Prayer is the method by which we have a conversation with God and are modeled in a better relationship with the Lord's purpose for our lives. Prayer is the instrument that draws water from God's inexhaustible well, the pouring out of thy soul before the Lord Almighty. Prayer is the gathering of resources for renewed encounters. You ought to pray. As one writer says, uh, in the deep like Jonah did, you ought to pray in bondage like the Israelites did, on the rooftop, on the housetop, like Peter did. 
in the mountain like Moses did and in the wilderness like Jesus did. Prayer is important. So if you're going to bounce back after overwhelming difficulties, you got to push through your pain with powerful praying. And then, brothers and sisters, here it is. After he receives the direction, after he sees the okay, after he receives the affirmation, because the Bible says here clearly, it says, and he answered him, pursue, for you shall utter, you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. God still hears and answers prayers. He responded to David. He affirmed David. He confirmed his move and his direction in life. Brothers and sisters, here it is. Now, finally, David's able to face the fragmentation with his forward faith. So David embarks upon a path of forward faith. Here it is. Faith and work should travel side by side, step answering to step, like the legs of men walking. First faith and then the works, then faith and again, then the works again. And they can scarcely distinguish which is the one and which is the other. There is a faithful reaction by David. Listen what happens in verse number nine. It says, so David went and the 600 men who were with him and came to the brook and where those they were left behind. But David pursued he and 400 men for 200 stayed behind who were so weary and they could not cross the brook. Brothers and sisters, when you have a forward faith, there are some people that will not be able to go with you. There will be some people that may not accompany you. It could be family. It could be friends. It could be people that you thought would be there with you to the journey and to the end. But I want to suggest the text shows us that David began with 600, but 200 stayed behind because the text says that they were weary. They were exhausted. They were overwhelmed and they could not continue on. So I want to suggest to you, don't fault them, don't fuss at them, and don't become frustrated by them. But you got to keep moving forward because God has given you the faith. You have the faith the size of a mustard seed to continue to push your hand. There must be a faithful reaction. So it says David, so David went. But brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you that when there's a faithful reaction, there's also faithful results. Look what the text says. It says, then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and they gave him bread. And he ate and they left him. They let him in drink water. Verse 12. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two chambers or two clusters rather of raisins. And so when he had eaten, his strength came back to him for he had eaten no bread, no drink water for three days and three nights. And then David said to him, whom do you belong? Where are you from? And so notice how God will use the most unusual person. The person that you least expect. The one that you don't anticipate that will be your source and your pathway or your vessel to recovering what God is intended, intended for you to recover. He uses this Egyptian. But notice what David does. David understood that this man was a foreigner. This man was a stranger. And David understood the writings of scripture, understood the sacred text. He understood the Pentateuch. He understood the Levitical writings that when you see a stranger along the roadside, that you're not to try to disrupt him, destroy him, or devour him, but to provide him assistance and aid. And as a result of David following the word exactly the way it's printed, the way it's shared, God opened up a window, opened up an opportunity for him to move toward recovery. Listen to what the text says. It says that he said, verse number 12, verse number 13, then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant to the Amalekites. It was the enemy <laughs> that tried to destroy the camp that God would use somebody in that camp 
to get them to a better place in a better station in life. He said, my master left me behind because three days I, I go and I fall sick. Verse 14, we made an invasion in the southern area of the Territites and the territories belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb. And, and we burned Ziglag with fire. So God brings him back to the place of the person uh, of the crew that was responsible, but God is going to use an inside man, an inside resource into the camp of the enemy to move him toward recovering all. And I stopped by today to tell you, brothers and sisters, you have to be careful how you handle people. You got to be careful how you treat people because God may put something right in your lap, lap that you did not anticipate, that you did not expect, that you were blown off that God will be able to use that person to get you to the place where you need to be, to move you toward a place of recovery, to move you to a place of results. That's why it's important to do it just the way God tells you to do. And he will open up doors that no man can close and pour you out a blessing that you don't have enough room to receive. Here it is. The text says, in verse number 15, it says, and David said to them, can you take me down to this troop? Now, he's going to take this man who was inside the Amalekites team, crew, band of raiders, and he gives intel to David. Because of David's faithful reaction, now comes faithful results. God provides something for David. So it says, so he said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master and will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down uh, there, they were they were spread out all over the land. The Malachites were everywhere, exactly where the Egyptians said that they would be. Look at God using this man to bring forth faithful results to David. Not expected, unusual. But God uses that source, that resource, that vessel, that tool to benefit, to bless, to help and assist the man of God, the people of God, the person of God. To bring him favorable and faithful results. Notice what happens. Since then, David attacked him from twilight until evening to the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 men who are rolled off on camels and fled. But here it is. This is where I want us to get. In verse number 18, it says, So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. <laughs> so now as a result of David moving forward with forward faith, he gets a faithful reaction. He does exactly what God tells him to do. He has faithful results. Now he has a faithful recovery. The text says that David recovers all. And that's why I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things yet not seen. That God is a reward of those who diligently seek him. God says, if you'll be good to me, I'll be good to you. He says, I will bring you faithful results. If you move forward in faith, he said, I will bring you a faithful recovery. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, young boy named Todd, who's three years old, from Rhode Island, went down to the seacoast to fly a kite. Never having flown a kite before, Todd had obvious doubts. His father assured him that all was well and the kite would go up as it planned. And Todd unraveled the spring, watched the kite go up, and he was heard to say, I knew it would fly, Daddy. You said it would. And that's what God has said to us. Whatever I say is settled. Whatever I assure you of, it will happen. If you will just only believe, just only trust God, you can bounce back after 
overwhelming difficulties. If you walk through your weariness with worthwhile weeping, emerge above your extremities with effective encouragement. Push through your pain with powerful praying and face your fragmentation with a forward faith. You can bounce back after, over, after overwhelming difficulties. If you only listen to the principles and the plans of David. David says in verse 18 that he recovered all, picks it back up again in verse 19. It says, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. He mentions it twice in this context. You can bounce back after overwhelming difficulties. May God bless you. May God forever keep you. It's my prayer. It's my fault. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, whatever has you in a dark room, whatever has caused the stain to be on your cheeks, whatever is causing anxiety in your soul, or whatever is causing you to be in a place of emotional unrest, you can bounce back after overwhelming difficulties. May God bless you. May God forever keep you as our prayer. If you're unsaved, if you're unchurched, if you don't know Christ, if you've never accepted him as your personal Savior, Lord, if you've not made a connection with him, today's a good day to know him. On that screen is my email address. We do want to invite you to uh, share with us your relationship, where you're at in your life and what's happening, we would love to be a part of that experience with you. Or perhaps you're one of those individuals that has accepted Christ some time in the past in your life, but you have become despondent, um, not willing to reconnect because of some factors and issues that may have caught you off guard and uh, caught you by surprise and uh, dashed your hopes and your dreams. But I want to suggest today that you can reconnect and re-engage with God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer together. God, our Father, we're so thankful for this day. Master, most of all, I'm thankful for your daughter, son, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for allowing us to, uh, to worship you in spirit and truth. We ask that you bless us, give us strength, give us encouragement, and give us wisdom as we navigate through this moment. We're praying for that man or woman that needs to confess. Admit, believe that you are the, the source of strength, the source of their life. We're praying, oh God, that you will renew their faith, give them energy, give them wherewithal to get through whatever they're going through at this moment in time. Cover them, love them, encourage them, support them. And they believe, God, that, that you are there to give them a gift. And they understand that it's not something that they can work for, but it's by grace that they can be saved if they will confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. Thou shall be saved. God, we're praying for those individuals right now as they make that commitment, as they make that choice. I also pray for the other individual, God, that wants renewal or restoration or rededication. Praying, oh God, that you will speak afresh in their lives and help them understand that they are not by themselves, but that you can reconnect them and restore the joy back into their heart. And we're praying for all these blessings, these interactions, and these encounters. It's in your daughter and son, Jesus Christ, saying we do pray. Amen, and thank God. Once again, I'm excited that God has blessed us with this opportunity to come together to share the dialogue, to discuss uh, the directives of God as to what he has to offer, what he wants to bring forth to you in this season in your life. May God forever keep you and bless you is our prayer. We pray that you will be strengthened and encouraged as always. Walk with the King and be blessed. Thank you so much, Dr. Chambers, for that message. You can join us here on this platform every Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock a.m. and at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So many people have asked the question, what does partnering with Envision Christian Fellowship mean? It consists of daily prayers, 
weekly teaching and preaching, monthly encouragement from the ministry team, you gain an authentic relationship with the ministry team, and if you desire additional pastoral services, they are available upon request. Other ways to partner? You can partner through praying with a team of committed ambassadors of Christ affiliated with Envision Christian Fellowship monthly. You can partner through serving with a team of committed ambassadors of Christ affiliated with Envision Christian Fellowship quarterly. You can partner through connecting with local, regional, and international nonprofits. And you can partner through giving consistently to Envision Christian Fellowship, either weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. And you can contribute through Cash App or PayPal. And you guys, all of that information is listed on the screen. Again, Thank you all so much for joining us today for worship. Next time, we hope that you invite someone to worship with you. We hope that you all have a blessed day and stay safe. Bye for now.